Dear respectful fellow practitioners, Ami Toho. Today, I would like to continue to practice to learn how to understand Buddhism. Usually for the beginners, as a teacher, we always encourage them to start understanding Buddhism with the basic stuff. Although it's basic for Buddhist practitioners, we cannot look down on the basics. We must know Buddhism has very profound and deep observations and truths in it. It's different from religion commonly known in the world. This is the first thing we must understand. Buddhism is what we call an education, not a religion. What Buddha teaches is wisdom, high-level wisdom, profound wisdom. What does it mean by profound wisdom? What was Shakyamuni Buddha's goal? It was to help all beings liberate themselves from suffering, not just a simple normal relief from suffering, but relief from the ultimate suffering to achieve full happiness. That means you no longer have to suffer. It's not just for a temporary moment but forever. Today, if you're able to understand and accept Buddhism, and if you practice Buddhism, you are not a common person, because only a person with wisdom will select this path. Why we can't fully comprehend the teaching is because we all have illness. We all have troubles. Therefore, our wisdom cannot be realized. There are very deep conditions that we have planted for many lives in the past that keep us from even hearing of the word Buddha, let alone understand it. It's not easy to practice Buddhism. It has high wisdom. But do not think everything is high wisdom. All the major sutras like the Avatamsaka Sutra or the Diamond Sutra start from the basics, even though their content is profound. So today we will learn about a couple of very important lessons. Today, we Buddhists, we want to learn from Shakyamuni Buddha, our teacher. So if we want to learn from our teacher, our master, what is the most important thing to learn from him? The first thing is right awakening. First, we need to have a goal. First, we need to learn how to be awakened. This is very important. Awakening means you're aware, you understand. But this awareness is not just simple awareness, because there is one condition before that. It's called right awakening. It's different. If you add this word right, the whole meaning is different. So what does right awakening mean? We must take our time to understand this. Nowadays, there are a lot of smart and talented people. Especially in this modern world, we have a lot of genius-level scientists. We have talented scientists, talented engineers who devise a lot of innovations and discoveries in the tech sector and the scientific sector, because we are in the era of technology. This is what defines our era. If you do not follow along in this era, you will get kicked out of the queue. You will be left behind. So that is why it is a struggle for a lot of older people, because technology has been developed at a speed that is very fast, astoundingly fast. For example, even just two years ago, we never thought we would do this online. And now, can you imagine we conduct the Dharma ceremony and stuff without these technologies, without the internet, without computers? We're forced to use it, including myself. I'm forced to use it every day. So sometimes when I meet young kids, when I come across young kids, when they see me struggling with phones, they laugh at me. They say, even a kid knows how to operate a smartphone. 
So how can you be so clueless about it? I am always being laughed at in this regard. If you look at the Japanese news, a lot of their temples and sanghas have robots. Obviously, they dress them as a monk, and they even sculpted one robot after Buddha, and they are like service robots. They can also talk about sutras. It's kind of like a Q&A. They allow you to ask questions and answer you. So, for example, if you have any issue, you can ask this Buddhist Alexa about your issues. Ask for their guidance, and as long as you can call the number, you will be linked to the system, and that system is like a call center. So this is the level of development in our technological era. In the future, even the role of monks will be replaced by robots and AI. If you do not believe me, look it up. It's true. However, no matter how developed technology is, if it's not wisely used, it will always cause more harm than good, and very big trouble can be caused by technology, mostly because it is destructive. It's exploitative and destructive towards nature. Let's talk about humans. We say the husband and wife are the closest group of family, unit of family. Nowadays, if you look at couples, do you think husbands and wives are closer, or husbands and iPhones, or wives and iPhones? I saw a case where a lay Buddhist, he's a guy, and he has a family, and if his wife is not at home, maybe she has gone out shopping or somewhere else, it doesn't even matter if she's late returning home. But when he lost his phone, he threw a fit. It's like, where's my phone? So this is a not-so-normal thing which I have observed. These technologists, philosophers, scientists, and religious workers are very smart, and they should be. They are leaders of their communities. They are innovators. However, even though they are very intelligent and their IQ is way above average, Buddha will not give them the title, the qualification of having right awakening. So their intelligence is not considered, not qualified as right awakening. We must understand why these people who are in the top percentile of human intelligence are not considered rightly awakened. In Buddhism, the word right, right view, right awakening, right thought, right speech, is not easy to obtain. Even if you want to actually achieve this level, it's not easily obtained by anyone. So how come their intelligence is not considered as right awakening? Very simply, it is because their heart has not been freed from afflictions. Their heart is bound by their habits and desires. They are smart, but they have not severed their afflictions. They have not purified their heart, their mind. They are still entangled with things and people. Like, you're right, I'm wrong. All of the worldly conflicts. They still have hatred, greed, ignorance, and arrogance, especially arrogance. On top of that, they have wandering thoughts, discriminations, or prejudice, and attachments to things or people. They have selfishness, and they are attached with desires of amassing profits and prestige. No matter how capable their mental faculties are, they're not rightly awakened. That's why, from this, we understand how important right awakening is. The number of people who chant Amitopo, to be honest, is a lot. But how many actually made it 
to the pure land from this earth because they haven't achieved the level of right awakening. A lot of people think that Amitabha Buddha will bestow a lot of fortunes on them. They come for that, but they have not seen the awakening side of it. And the whole core of right awakening is about a pure heart. It's about your heart instead of your mind. Is your state of mind pure, clear of afflictions from clouded judgments? Is your heart pure? If your heart is pure, if your wisdom is crystal clear, that means you have pierced through things very clearly without clouded judgment. Only then is it called right awakening. Because a pure heart nurtures this kind of wisdom that is able to awaken you to the reality of everything. This wisdom, the use of this wisdom is called right awakening. The standard of right awakening is only available in Buddhism and the teachings of Buddha. Because as long as we are in the six realms, everything we see, everything we understand is not considered right awakening because of the reasons mentioned, the afflictions. Today you chant Amitofo, the same thing happens. It all relies on a pure heart. A chant of Amitofo that comes from a pure heart is very powerful. So what are we trying to learn from Buddha, Shakyamuni Buddha, our original teacher? The first step is to achieve right awakening. Only when we are rightly awakened can we truly understand how to navigate out of this suffering. Without right awakening, we can get out of this puzzle. Even if we want to go to the pure land, which is liberation from the puzzle of suffering, we can't go there because we are not letting go of the afflictions that bind us here, of the attachments. Only when you have attained the level of right awakening are you qualified to be liberated from the cycle of life and death, liberated from the sufferings to happiness. Otherwise, departing from this principle, even though we're chanting Amitofo, worshiping the Buddha, or listening to the Dharma, it's all about fortune rather than the true merits that are able to bring you to liberation. So it's all about a pure heart. This is a very concise summary of right awakening. When you hear right awakening, it means having a pure heart. Right awakening equals to having a pure heart. Having a pure heart means that you are unmoved by the phenomena that happens to you outside. Whether it be people or things or calamities or anything, you're unmoved. Only then are you considered as having a pure heart. If one achieves the pure heart or right awakening in Buddhism, what is the title we confer to these people? If you have achieved right awakening in Buddhism, in this educational system, what is the status that would be conferred upon you? We must be clear on this very important terminology used. There are titles like university degrees that are conferred upon people reaching right awakening, and this title is called Arhat. So if you have achieved right awakening, you will be called an Arhat. Just like today, when you graduate from the first level of university study, it's called a bachelor's degree. So Arhat is the same in Buddhist education. Arhat, Bodhisattva, and Buddha are the common titles that we confer to people upon achieving different degrees of awakening. If you achieve the first step of right awakening, you are called an Arhat. Why is one called an Arhat? Because you are no longer twisted in views and ideas. You see things clearly. Your greed, hatred, and ignorance does not exist. It will not come up. It's cleared. 
and Arhat does not have entanglements with people and matters, because Arhats do not attach to the notion of the body as themselves. That means no more ego. They are no longer attached to their bodies. So what does Bodhisattva mean? We will talk about this next time. So Arhat is the first level title in Buddhist education. I hope it's clear for you guys. The best way to define Arhat is one having a pure heart. Pure heart means right awakening. Why is it pure? Because they no longer have erroneous views and ideas. And that means it's no longer twisted, no longer biased. They have no hatred, they have no greed, they have no ignorance, they have no afflictions, and they do not entangle with people and matters because they no longer attach with the self. From here, we hopefully learn and experience that the Buddhist education system is actually different from the worldly religious and secular education that we are going through right now. So what do we actually learn from Buddha? We must be clear in this regard. Buddha taught us to cultivate the realization of truth, to cultivate right awakening. Only when we achieve right awakening can we solve the fundamental problem and be truly liberated from the pain that has plagued us forever and no longer go through all of this again and again and again. Because only when you learn, truly learn, truly listen to Buddha's words and truly use your ability to learn will you achieve liberation. That's the first lesson. If we look at the worldly joy and sufferings, starting from the obvious ourselves, we have to go through the eight sufferings of life. These are sufferings that we have to live through every day without a way out. For example, if you look at our world of pain and pleasure, if there is pain, there is always pleasure. If there is pleasure, it will always be followed by pain. In the Pure Land, they call it ultimate bliss for a reason, because they only have real bliss, instead of having pain following it around. But over here, we have a lot of pain that follows the pleasure. From the perspective of pain and pleasure, the most obvious, the most easily observed part of suffering that we have to go through is that no one can avoid birth, age, illness, and death. Can you avoid it? No, right? And on top of these four, we have the suffering of not getting what we wish for, what we love. We can't get it. What we like, we can't get. And then the sixth one is our loved ones leaving us. There was a case where in this form of suffering, when a loved one's leaving us, there was an old lady who laid on the bed dying, and when she died, she left her eyes open, so she did not go in peace. When she passed away, her eyes kept looking in one direction, one place, because she could not let go of her most beloved granddaughter. So this is another type of suffering, even until death. Then we have the suffering of encountering someone or something you dislike. So all of these combined with the suffering of the five skandhas compose the eight sufferings of life. No one can escape them from here. These are the eight sufferings that we all have to go through every day. So does Buddha have any way to help us get out of this? Buddha told us if we practice Buddhism, if we practice the path he gave to us, which is right awakening, just with the first step, right awakening, we can be free from these eight sufferings. For example, today in the cultivation group, some of us are seniors. 
like 60 or 70 and above. We think about, does Buddhism help us to relieve or liberate us from this phenomena of age, of illness? To be honest, if we truly cultivate the teaching, if we truly understand the teaching and use it, you would not need doctors or medicine. You can recover from your ailments as well as prevent them. There are cases like that. Why? What's the reason? Including myself, we should think about it and reflect on this. What are the reasons? Because they have realized the truth. Before we realize the truth, we keep asking, how did the illness come about, right? Beyond the medical, the physical, observable part, I'm talking about how it arised, how it came into being, and what were the conditions that led to this illness to develop and spread, and what are the consequences and effects from this illness in general. Buddha told us, we can avoid illness. Humans can actually avoid illness. People can avoid illness, but we need to know why. Why do we have illness in old age? Why do we have these sufferings? Because the root of these sufferings is our wandering thoughts that keep generating and regenerating the same conditions that lead us to suffering. So if you use a more common term, we're thinking everywhere. We're thinking left, right, up and down. We are always thinking. We never stop. We never rest. We're not honest in a sense. Our mind is not honest. It's like the monkey in our mind keeps jumping and jumping and jumping, one thought after another. Therefore, Buddha told us, as long as you have wandering thoughts, even a sage doctor or some cultivated person like Hua Tuo in China, who was a very, very good doctor, who healed a lot of ailments, can't treat your problem, this kind of problem, this illness. Talking about Mr. Hua Tuo, talking about ancient China, the medical history, before the Qing Dynasty united China, there was a person behind the engineering of unification. He was called Mr. Qing, who was treated as such an important figure in Chinese history. Mr. Hua To, Dr. Hua To, maybe not him, I think, sorry, he was in the Three Kingdoms era, Sorry, there was another very good doctor, but he could not treat this illness. Because he kept thinking, because of wandering thoughts, he kept thinking about illness. His mind kept generating the condition of illness. If our wandering thoughts are blocking us from returning to the pure state of mind, it will always beat you in the current condition of the six realms or in our realm, life and death, life and death, life and death. It all comes from wandering thoughts. The six realms arise from wandering thoughts. So Buddha in the Avatamsaka Sutra said, all beings have the wisdom and virtues of the thus come one. That's another title for the Buddha. However, Due to wandering thoughts and discrimination, they cannot realize it. So the point is he has pointed out the roots of our illness in the grand scheme of life and death in this one sentence. Using a recent example that just happened in this decade, Venerable Master Hai Xian, who just passed away in 2013, he lived to 112 years old, being born in the Qing dynasty. He could climb the trees at the age of 112. The year he went to the Pure Land, he could still 
climb the trees, and he could do all of the rough work on the farm. Even a 40-year-old could not do that, but he did all this by himself at the age of 112. Even if you ask some of the young people nowadays to do all this in one day, the volume of the chores that he had to do on his farm near the temple is a lot, yet he could do it. How did he achieve this level of health? His heart was pure. That's why he could do that. How come his heart was pure? Because he always used Amitopo as the object of his thoughts, no longer allowing any other thoughts to mix in. So his heart was pure. His heart only has Amitopo. Hence, it was pure because of this one thing. As long as your heart is pure, illness will not have an effect on you. It is a way to reflect for us, especially myself. It's true. Therefore, today, we always say, I am ill, I caught a cold, and stuff like that. To be honest, beyond the physical body, it is actually our thoughts as well, our mind. Because if we put our energy and mind not on our illness, but on cultivation, and in terms of us, Amitofo, if we focus on Amitofo, our mind will be pure and focused. Then we no longer fall ill, truly, as long as you have a pure heart. If we look into the Tripitaka, if we look into all of the records of Buddha himself, do they mention anything about Buddha falling ill or sick in his original state? Did he appear ill and aged in his original state? No. Have you read of Bodhisattvas, the students of Buddha? The chief students of Buddha also fall ill? No. Have you heard of Guanyin Bodhisattva? Guanyin falling ill in the middle of his Dharma talk? Did he ever take time off from his Dharma talks because he caught a cold or had a headache or fever? No. Have you ever seen anywhere in any of the sutras that says, Bodhisattva Guanyin, Siddhi Garba, Manjushri fell ill? No. Even our hats do not fall ill or age. To be honest, they are no longer bound by this, what we call the worldly law of life and death. They have been liberated. They have liberated themselves. To be honest, it's not fake. It happens. But how do we do that? What's the reason for them achieving that? Buddha and Bodhisattvas thoroughly realized the truth of this universe, how it came to be in all these conditions. So once they understood that, they immediately followed their true nature. They no longer used thoughts. Because they had no wandering thoughts, everything they did flowed naturally from their Buddha nature, their true heart, their pure heart. So everything they did was without pretensions because being natural is the healthiest thing. So nowadays the technology is very advanced. However, the cause of this advancement is the destruction of nature, of the environment. If we look at this earth right now that we live in, it's already sick, gravely sick, gravely ill, because we keep destroying it. If we look nowadays at these COVID pandemic times, it gets more and more serious and more contagious. It keeps evolving, mutating, because our hearts are not pure. All this COVID, all this pandemic, why does it mutate? It mutates in accordance with our heart in accordance with our thoughts. If our thoughts and our heart turns pure, focuses on pure stuff, I can tell you, you will no longer be affected by it if our hearts are pure and clean. If you look at the pure land, is there any sutra that says any pandemic happened in the pure land 
or in the land of the Buddha? No. Because the Pure Land is comprised of people who have an environmentalist heart, all the residents of the Pure Land are environmentalists. Why? Because their hearts are pure, so they purify their environment. So why is our world in such a state? Because we are polluting it with our wandering thoughts. The root cause of our illness is because of our wandering thoughts, discriminations, and attachments. It comes from that. If you want to be healthy, you must cultivate a pure heart. To start cultivating a pure heart for right awakening, we need to start letting go of attachments that we have strongly adhered to. Let go of any situation, adverse or favorable. In case of adverse conditions, something that causes us to be unhappy, we let go and chant Amitofo to replace it. Once you do that as a habit, your heart gets purified further and further, hence your health gets better. If we practice Buddhist teachings, we must listen to Buddha's advice to let go of these afflictions, because only a pure heart can nurture true wisdom and right awakening. The problem of us practitioners of Buddhist teachings is that we are not listening to the Buddha's advice. We're not putting in our heart. Yes, we come here to attend the sessions, but a lot of people say, I'm busy, I have a lot of work, I have a lot of chores or family business to tend to. A lot of excuses sometimes, to be honest. In this world, other than cultivating Amitabha's name in our heart, nothing else you do can be brought to the next one. Very few people in this world can live to be 100 years old. Even if you reach 100 years old, it is nothing compared to eternity. In this tiny speck of our existence in this universe, why aren't we doing something that we can exchange for something bigger and infinite instead of clinging to something that cannot last? True, it is like that. We must listen to Buddha's teachings because he's been there. If we do not listen, we'll still cling to this entanglement, get entangled in these afflictions. Only from a pure heart, a heart free from all this selfishness and afflictions, entanglement, can we nurture true wisdom that leads you to right awakening. However, on the other hand, if our heart is not pure, if our mind is not pure even though we are wise and smart, Buddha and Bodhisattvas will not recognize our wisdom and smarts as right awakening. They will not. Because the person who attains right awakening, an arhat, does not get bound by life and death. Let's call it the state of cessation of life and death, or nirvana. If you transcend the six realms, if you achieve right awakening through having a pure heart, birth, aging, sickness, and death are no longer a problem. All of our afflictions come from a polluted heart. If we get through these issues by achieving right awakening, they no longer matter. What about the rest? Nothing else can trouble you anymore. If we have solved the problem of life and death, that means we're no longer bound by it. Everything else is not a problem. Our lives will be truly happy and fulfilling in this way. This is what we should seek from Buddhism. Only then can we be happy. To do that, to achieve that, we need to start following Buddha's teachings, his education. However, if we treat Buddhism as a religion, a dogmatic approach, we can never achieve right awakening, which brings us towards the ultimate happiness. And that means we cannot stop suffering because we are still lost. Religion itself, the nature of religious worshipping is being lost. Call it superstitious in a way. 
Why is it superstitious? Emotion is the basis of religion. In English, there's two words, emotion and sensibility. Emotion, in other words, is called blind faith. Buddhism does not encourage blind faith. It encourages <laughs> rational, clear, precise thinking. Some religions use blind faith as a tight leash on its worshippers. And the more devoted you are to that emotion, we call them the more truly devoted, sincere worshippers. The more lost you are, the better it is. They are labeled as devoted and there is a leash so that you can't escape. If you look at some religions, there are a lot of evangelists that try to woo disciples into their congregation as part of that religion that uses this evangelist approach. They use that mindset to get students and then there are cases where it's very well known, if you don't believe in me, you go to hell. There are religions that always use this kind of an approach using a leash on the people. They feel obligated to pray and worship every day and to give donations to them. This is a common problem among religions nowadays. I'm real, you're fake, holier than thou. But to be honest, at the end of the day, none of them knows what is happening. None of them solve the real problems. Hence, it is fake. Buddhism is never like that. Buddhism is not about followers. How many people come and follow me? Why? Because it's all about education. Education is about teachers and students, disciples and masters. There's a very important phrase, there's only disciples who seek answers from the master. Never heard of a master who asks for a student to teach. What does it mean? We'll talk about it in the next session. Only students seek answers from masters, so seek teachings from the teacher. A teacher should not come to you and tell you to learn from him. Going back to the point, we need to start with right awakening. To be rightly awakened, we need to have a pure heart. We need to learn the practice of purifying our hearts. Without a pure heart, everything you learn in Buddhism is just planting a seed of Buddhism for the future. It does not have an immediate effect on your current condition. It will not be used to help you to elevate your current condition. Therefore, Shakyamuni Buddha's appearance in this world is just to help you to liberate from suffering. And the first level you have to go through is life and death. And to liberate from life and death, you need to start with right awakening. To start from right awakening, you use your pure heart. In our terms, we use Amitabha Buddha's name to cultivate our pure heart. This is a very simple overview on what we should seek in Buddhism. Next session, I look forward to learning more with you about Buddhism, understanding Buddhism. I would also like to announce that this Friday I will also practice talking about the original vows of Kasidigarbha Bodhisattva, Di Zang. In the evening around 8 p.m., we will have a session on this sutra and we'll dedicate our merits together after that. So now back to understanding Buddhism. That's it for today. I hope everyone can cultivate their pure heart. Put in the effort because the only person who benefits from doing this is yourself. I hope that you can have something to carry home with you. So a good evening to everyone, to you, and may you be prosperous and healthy. Thank you so much. Amitofo. Let's dedicate our merits. Let's join our palms. Use your own name and repeat after me. May I use the merits accrued from now me, a student of Buddha, 
Eric would like to dedicate the merits of listening to this Dharma talk to all of my karmic creditors so that they may be born in the Pure Land. Also dedicate the merits to all beings in the Ten Directions and also dedicate them toward world peace. May the calamities be turned from big to small, small to none. Repay the four kindnesses above and relieve the suffering of those in the three paths below. May those who see and hear of this aspire to invoke the Bodhi heart and cultivate the teachings for the rest of this life and then be born together in the land of ultimate bliss. Amitofo. Amitofo. Chi